I had actually booked another role on a film called Godzilla, and it was like a major role, it would have been a huge break, and I had booked a lead role on a show called Divergent, which was like gonna pay me a lot of money. They had my, um, my rights on the 100. They had to approve me to be released to do these other jobs, and they didn't. They said, no, no, we need them. We don't know. We don't want something to conflict. And as soon as they did that, those other jobs fired me and then they fired me. And so I was like, so they got me to work on the Sabbath. They cut out my other jobs that would have been financially life-changing. And that was when I first got un the understanding of how Hollywood works. I was like, oh, they don't care about you at all. Welcome to LED Live. It's a show where we use the light of Christ to expose the darkness found in media and our culture today. And today we have Eli Gore with us. Welcome to the LED Live table. Oh, thank you guys for having me. I appreciate it. We're in the presence of somebody famous. Oh. <laughs> I just had to throw that out on the table. No, it's a pleasure to meet you. I've, I've actually heard your name a few times in the circles of what we do, you know, so... It's awesome to officially have you on our show. Really nice to meet you guys too. I've you know, seen your guys' ministry. I really appreciate the work you do. Awesome. Yeah. So for those who don't know, Eli is a former actor who's worked on shows like Riverdale and The 100 and played Muhammad Ali in One Night in Miami, directed by Regina King. But we met in church. So I'm not going to share too much of your story. I'll let you do that. Uh, but before we begin, I'd actually like to share with our viewers that we launched a YouTube channel called Little Light Kids. There you can find wholesome content exclusively for children, teaching them good values, um, helping them learn about God's creation, and also showing them how to strengthen their walk with Christ in fun, creative ways. You can find us on YouTube by searching Little Light Kids or click on the link in the description of this video. Please go check out Little Light Kids and share it with the children in your life to enjoy and to make sure, make sure that you subscribe so you can see when new videos are posted. Eli. Take us back to the beginning, like where are you from? And also what sparked your interest in what became your career path? Um, so I'm originally from a small city in, uh, in Canada, Halifax, Nova Scotia. And um, my, I guess what sparked my interest, what first sparked my interest was uh, I was not raised in the church at all. And I, and I was a big Michael Jackson fan when I was okay. a little kid. I mean, I, I really wanted to be Michael Jackson. That was like my ambition. I just thought there was something, the fact that he was a little kid and, uh, and then he grew up and he was like doing all this stuff and it was so enticing and it always seemed like he had kids around, like, mm. you know, and it just seemed like, you know, so interesting to me. And so that was like my first thing. I, I remember my mom saying that I would just, just sing and dance and sing and dance and try to be like Michael Jackson for hours. She would just put me in the room and can you do the Put Michael walk? Jackson? <laughs> I, I, not, I won't now, but there was a time when I had worked on it quite a bit. But um, so that was like the first initial thing that I remember as a kid, just really being into cartoons, really being into Michael Jackson. My older brothers and sisters were always listening to music in the house. And so I was really into like just entertainment as just as a consumer of entertainment at a very young age. Mm. And then um, my mom was, uh, was a mature student and uh, she was doing her degree and when I was young and, and there would often be, cause Halifax is kind of a university town. There's St. Mary's University, Dalhousie University, Mount, uh, how does it Mount? Anyway, there's, an, there's like four or five pretty large universities. Okay. And, um, and so there would always be interesting people. And it's also kind of a port city. So there's just like always a lot of different types of people, musicians, artists, different educators. And, um, and so she was having a, a get together at the house and uh, some people were there that were young producers for uh, the CBC, which is like the BBC, but it's Canada's gotcha. version. Okay. And um, and they were producing kids content, interestingly enough, to, mm. given your uh, your plug just now. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were doing something for Sesame Park, which is our Sesame Street. Mm -hmm. And um, and they saw me, and I guess I don't know why I did anything or what, but they you know were talking to me, and then they asked my mom, you know, we're doing this thing, and we're looking for a kid who can do singing and dancing and this and that. Would Eli, you know, be able to do it? And my mom was always kind of like, even at a young age, she kind of talked to us almost like in a mature way, and so she just was like, well, let him decide, kind of thing. Hmm. And I was like, you know, so into it and so excited because I was like, this is it. This, you know, I'm going to be Michael Jackson, you know, yeah. and uh, Janet Thompson was the producer's name. And, and she um, she asked and I said, yeah, and I was like five. And mm. then uh, and then I, you know, she brought me out and we shot these 
scenes for Sesame Park and I would sing and I would dance and do these things. And I think she won a couple of producing awards for it. And and I got paid. And as a young kid, you know, getting thousands of dollars, you're thinking, oh, wow. man, like this is <laughs> this is pretty, you know, I didn't even know what that meant. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? I just knew like penny candies I could buy like yeah. lifetime <laughs> you supply. Know how much I can buy? <laughs> <laughs> and then my mom was like, no, you put it in the bank. But um, <laughs> so so that was my introduction. And then from there, I kind of had two tracks as a young person. I kind of, my brother was a very, very talented athlete. Um, he, you know, was an all Canadian. Uh, he actually went on to play professional basketball in Europe for a little while. And, um, and so I had always kind of thought about being an athlete and, you know, kind of following what he was doing because he was like kind of the big man on campus around town and stuff mm -hmm. like that. But then I was also on the side, always doing these kind of artistic things. So I would do, uh, you know, there was this place called the Center for Art Tapes and I would make like, you know, music videos for my friends or I would, um, you know, do drama classes or if there was a local play, I would be involved in the plays for Black History Month or just mm -hmm. everything and anything. And it just kind of accumulated to the point where I had quite a large portfolio at a pretty young age for someone from that town okay. of things that I had done. And even, you know, I was, I was DJing and hosting a radio show um, in high school um, that was, you know, pretty popular around the city and, you know, things like that. So, um, putting on live events. And so when I finished high school, um, you know, I, <laughs> I had to face reality that I was not as good at basketball as my brother was, <laughs> nor was I as tall or as athletic. Okay. So yeah. So after high school, I was kind of like, okay, what am I going to do? Am I going to go to school? Am I going to, you know, basketball is not going to really be a real thing. You know, there's not a lot of stuff in Halifax, and I end up calling. Um, <laughs> this is how like it, how little I knew about the industry. So in Halifax, uh, there are there's only one casting director. Hmm. Wow. One in the whole scene. I know you can't even like I, I've never been that. to Halifax, but is it like that small? Of a no, town I mean or? there's probably about three hundred thousand people, wow, but it's okay. just I don't know why there was just one casting director, and so. Mm -hmm. um, I, as little as I knew, I literally picked up the phone. I looked up the casting director. I called and I said, hey, uh, my name's Eli. I'm, I'm looking for a job. Uh, you know, <laughs> and I'm like thinking like this is just like, you know, calling McDonald's or something like mm -hmm. trying to get a job. And, and she was like, it doesn't really work like that. <laughs> mm. But I actually have something that I'm casting for and you might be good for it. Yeah. Come in. Um, and this was kind of my first dramatic piece that I had done. Um, and it was, you know, it was, I think it was like thug number two or something like that. Like super stereotypical, <laughs> super ridiculous. But but for me, it was a great opportunity because it got me into the union. Mm. Um, and so I did that. And then I was like, okay, that's done. What am I going to do now? And, and I, there's no question of where you went to acting school. No, I mean, they didn't even, like, I didn't even have an agent or anything. Like, wow. there was, it was, I literally called, like, that would be crashing if you mm -hmm. did that in any other city, you know, mm -hmm. like it's super, super faux pas, which I've mm -hmm. actually also done and did mm -hmm. well anyway, <laughs> but you know, but yeah, but it just, you know, it just worked. So, um, so I finished that gig, I got in the union and then I was like, I talked to my sister who lived in Toronto at the time. And so the backstory on that is my brother-in-law, my sister and my brother-in-law had just gotten married and he was doing a lot of uh, background extra work around Toronto. And she was trying to get him out of that and get him into other things, but he would constantly like tell her that if he could, you know, he had to get 280 days of background in a year, which is very hard to do. Mm. Um, and if you could do that, then you could get in the union. He's like, if I could just get in the union, mm. you know, I'll be rolling in the jobs. You know, mm. like there's just so many opportunities. People are always telling me, you know, I would have a job if I was just union, you know, mm. and like telling her this to keep doing it, right? And so when she finds out that I'm in the union now, She's thinking like, oh, Eli's like basically Denzel Washington. Like if he just could, you know, so she's just like, yeah, come to Toronto. Come live with me. You're in the union. You know, oh, it's wow. going to be fine. You're going to be, you know, famous. So I was like, you know, I didn't have anything going and I, I wanted to keep working um, now that I'd kind of made that choice to go in the entertainment direction. So I was like, and I was making pretty good money for, you know my age and for, for being a thug <laughs> yeah well yeah well it, well even the street sense gig like i had an actual contract and stuff like that and so i was like i don't want to go to school i want to keep you know working and making money mm -hmm. so i went to toronto and i actually got an agent there uh through the same person who had got me on the childhood stuff she mm -hmm. knew someone in town and 
Uh, she was living there at the time too. And so I got an agent. I'm there. I'm with my, living, sleeping on my sister's couch. And, you know, I'm in the union and, um, and I'm, I don't get any work because I'm a, not a good actor. I'm a terrible mm. actor. I've never, <laughs> I, I had no skills. I had no training. I'd never done anything like of any repute, you know, just thug number two and, and hosting stuff. So, uh, so I didn't get no jobs, none, zero. I don't know my lines. I'm like the worst mm. actor ever. You also don't feel the need to study this out either. <laughs> no, and that's the thing. Like, I'm just like totally winging it, and I'm I'm stay, living with wow. a like I'm living with my sister, but I got a bunch of dude friends that are there too, and they're like one of them's a model, and one of them's a, a musician, and so like we're all like just, just kind of bopping like, around, Zen. thinking we're artists, exactly, and so. <laughs> Um, so, and my, and my agent is really bad. Like he's a terrible agent. He's always on vacation. Oh, wow. Like he, he's just like the worst agent. And I like, you know, he, he, God bless him, but he was not, a, he was not good at his job. And so we're both terrible. And so there's no jobs being had. And, uh, I do that for about a year. It felt like a lot longer, but it was probably about a year and a half. And then, um, I'm really, I'm like, okay, well, I don't want to just keep wasting my time. I think I'm going to go back to school and, you know, give this whole thing up. Right before I do that, I end up getting a commercial that um, it was like a PSA for Ontario. I don't even think I had any lines. I think I was just like a cook, mm -hmm. but they like close in on me. So like technically it was an acting job. And mm -hmm. then um, after I finished the commercial, there was a, a thing in the union where if it gets translated to any other language, it, you get the pay for that as if you did a whole other commercial. Mm -hmm. oh. And it got translated into like every language because toronto is super multicultural and okay. it was like a psa so i got like 10 times what i was supposed to get on this commercial which wasn't supposed to be a big thing at all which and ignited the flame again like which oh. was like yeah i gotta like, well it was the money well uh, yeah i got a big chunk of cash and so what happened was i um i had a my dad is from ghana and i didn't i didn't grow up with him but um i knew i had family in ghana and i had uh you know always wanted to get in touch with my african side of my family and I had a friend who was going to Ghana and who was going to be visiting for a while. And I now had this chunk of cash and I didn't, I was thinking about leaving the business. And I was like, hey, let me, um, do you think I could go with you guys? Do you think I go with you to Ghana? And I was like, I want to meet my family, but I wouldn't do it on my own. And, you know, and you got to already set up. And she was like, yeah, yeah. So um, I just took the money and I just decided, okay, I'm going to go to Ghana for as long as the money lasts. And then I'm going to come home and then I'm going to go to school. And the program that I was going to do was the King's, this, when I came back, I was planning on going to King's College and taking what's called the Foundational Year Program. Okay. And it still exists today. People can Google it. It's out there, King's College, Halifax, Foundational Year Program. And it's basically you study all the major writings of the foundational books of Western culture and civilization. Mm -hmm. And so um, it, the reason I was going to take it is because it, it basically counts as two years in one. Mm -hmm. And so I was thinking, since I took a year off, I'll do this program, catch up, I'll yeah. catch right back up. And then I'll, you know, I didn't miss a beat. And, and I was like, okay, well, they, they, they put out the list before you go into the program of the, all the books that they're going to cover. And I was like, well, if I'm going to be in Africa, I'm probably gonna have a lot of time just on my hands. I want to read, let me pick one of these books. And I'd actually already started reading some of the books. I finished the Iliad, I'd finished Homer, I finished a few other ones, read some of the Shakespeare stuff. And I was like, let me just find whatever the biggest book is. And that way I can just knock it off my list. I guess the Bible's on that list there too, There you right? go. And it was the Bible. <laughs> okay. Really? The biggest book Seriously? in that list wow. was the Bible. Mm -hmm. And so that's how I, I, I didn't even have a Bible. I had to go to my mom and then a funny story I've told it before was um, when I was a kid, my mom had this huge Family, family Bible. Bible. Oh my goodness, it's like and every <laughs> Is it the one with the Jesus' Last Supper on the front? No, no, it's like just like the goldish, like off-white mm -hmm. color, like mm -hmm. the like mm -hmm. kind of leather bound and um hard though. Mm -hmm. And um so anyway. Nice point seven. We weren't mm -hmm. like yeah, but we weren't a Christian family. She had gotten it as a gift, but it was in the house and she had once been in the faith and she had left and praise God she's back in now. But um I saw it when I was a kid and I was like, I just saw the big letters on the front. And I was like, Mom. Who's Holly Bibble? <laughs> and she was just like, she was like, oh no, my son, like you know, like. But I had that's how little I knew about anything religious. You know, I had no idea. I just thought it must be a really important person because her name was in like big print. You know, <laughs> um, but no. So I actually went back to my mom and I was like, hey mom, do you still got that that Bible? You know, I knew it was a Bible now as an adult, and I was like, you still got that Bible? And she was like, yeah. I was like, I want to take it with me to Africa. Um, and so I went to Africa. With this big old With this family. Giant family <laughs> Bible. It's awesome. And I like I had this backpack that my sister had got me, like that was like a 
piece it was like luggage backpack like it was a huge yeah. backpack and uh as like a gift for the trip and so i was traveling around ghana you know and and puts the gun out mm. of the thing and mm. says i said we're closed and i'm like so now i'm like oh my gosh where yeah. am i right and i remember thinking in that moment even though i was the most alone i'd ever been i felt a presence mm. i didn't feel alone and as the sun started coming up, I started to calm down. And I said, oh man, I was tripping. <laughs> <laughs> and my auntie Akko calls and she says, where you are right now, I wouldn't go there if the president of Ghana himself escorted me. Your, you, your life was like a mist. And it just all came flooding back on me like, whoa, okay, I made an agreement. I made an agreement with God mm -hmm. and I have to follow through because he did, he brought me through it. So anyhow, I, I went to Burkina Faso and it was, you know, a beautiful experience, but I mostly what I got out of that was my reading of the Bible changed and I got through the Old Testament and I now believed in God. Um, I didn't know if it was because I'd only read the Old Testament. I didn't know if it was Islam. I didn't know if it was Jewish. I didn't know if it was Christian, but I was determined to find out. Mm. And so when I got back to Canada, I also had a new desire to continue to act, but I said, you know what? I have a little bit of time. I'm going to give myself six months, but I'm going to be really serious about it. I'm actually going to like try to get good at this thing and put in the time. Okay. And um, I started doing, you know, local theater. I started doing uh, short films, student films, just anything I could to get in front of a group and, and practice. And this and, is back in Toronto. Yeah, in Toronto okay. again. And um, at the same time, I'm starting to learn more, trying to find out about God. So I'm talking, someone gave me a Quran. I'm starting to talk to Muslims. So I met some Jewish guys. I met some Sunday Christians. And, um, you know, I'm just kind of just feeling around with that, but um, still reading the Bible, you know, still trying to get to the end of it. And I get start getting better at acting. You know, I start getting pretty good. And, and I actually meet a guy, uh, Ryan Singh, you know, one of my mentors at the time. <laughs> and it's funny because He's actually married to an Adventist, which is so funny. I had no idea what an Adventist was, and I didn't know she was one. Hmm. But now I know. Um, hmm. But anyhow, he kind of takes me under his wing and starts teaching me the craft of acting, which as I look back now, there's so much of that that is <sighs> spiritualistic, if okay. not spiritualism, that I was learning. So it's like you're learning a craft, yeah. right? They call it a craft. Yeah. Well, what is craft? All you the know terminology you know? is all there. And, and so, but at the time, I'm like, man, I'm getting good at this. I'm getting ability, you know, mm -hmm. and and he's teaching me. And I ended up getting on this show called The Kink in My Hair, which was a pretty good show and a, a, a dramatic show. It was a, you know, a, a break break for me. And then I got another show out of that show. One of the directors hired me on to a show called Soul. Same manager? So what happened was this, the day I booked The Kink in My Hair, I fired my manager. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he was not happy about it. But I said, hey, man, you know, you know, you yeah, know, yeah. you know what's up. Like, come on. And he, he was upset, but he was also kind of like, yeah, yeah, I know. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, I, I went across town and I actually ended up, I Googled, you know, top agents in Toronto. And um, it was actually one of the top agents in North America at the mm. time because he was representing Drake. He was representing uh, Sinead Grimes from 90210. He was representing like... A, a list of these Canadian artists that were just blowing up, okay. you know, at, at around that time. And so um, I went in and I auditioned for him and he signed me. And, and I, you know, at that time, I really appreciated him because he showed me really how to be more professional in the business. But anyhow, um, Norbert Abrams, great uh, Jewish guy, great, nice guy and just solid, solid agent, very agenty. Okay. had pictures of swords behind his desk and like a husky, <laughs> just like super like think That's like, funny. yeah, classic agent. But anyway, um, so I got this other show based on that first show called Soul, which was about a gospel choir. And I was playing a tenor, a singer in the choir. And it's, you know, the dynamics that go on within a choir. But what happened in that experience was um, the producer of the show me and him were riding home one day from set and, you know, now I'm starting to like really have some conflicts internally because I'm reading the Bible, I believe in God, and I know I'm not living in a godly way. Okay. I'm living very much outside of what the Bible says. So this is in your personal life, in not, my not personal necessarily life. what Hollywood is asking you to do. Right. In my personal okay. life. Okay. I think it's just a matter of you're around so many other people that don't share those same moral 
compasses, mm. you know, and so it's just kind of the nature of the beast. It's like you're you're just influenced by everyone else around you. Yeah, it's easy to get yeah. sucked into that world. Well, and also, you know, to be honest, I think as a young man at that time, I'm trying to do two things at once. I'm trying to read the Bible and be what like what I'm reading mm -hmm. somewhat. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I believe it's true and I believe God is real. But then the other side of me is like, I want to be famous. I want to be My the man. Own. I want to be a player. I want to mm -hmm. be everything that mm -hmm. I think is cool. Mm -hmm. And that the world is telling you this is the goal. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Ellen White has this uh, great chapter called The Two Crowns. And one is like the worldly crown that is, has some glimmer and some shimmer to it, but it also has de degradation and is not, you know, is tinged. Mm -hmm. And the whole world is fighting and killing and clawing themselves to get that crown. And then there's this other crown that just a small group are trying to pursue. And that crown is like the the crown that is perfect and and pure, hmm. and you know, and so anyhow, that's a beautiful thing. If anyone ever looks into it, but hmm. uh, made me think a lot about the situation of being in in that environment. But I'm in this car. We're heading back from set, and um, his name was Andy Marshall, still one of my mentors today. And I just said to him, I said, you know, I've been reading the Bible. I know you're a Christian because he produced this Christian show that I'm on, and uh, it's not. It's a show about a church, but I know he's a Christian because he wrote it and produced it. And I said, you know, when I read the Bible, it says you're supposed to go to church on Saturday. Mm -hmm. I said, why do Christians, you're a Christian, why do Christians go to church on Sunday? Mm -hmm. And he says, well, my church doesn't go to church on Sunday. Oh, wow. Okay. And, <laughs> and I was like, really? Mm -hmm. and, and it's so funny because when we talk about it now... I know that he was like, oh, this young lost man is trying, you know, God help me give me the words to like yeah. not mess it up, wow. you know, and me, I'm thinking this is great. I'm getting, you know, this information I've been looking for. And he's like, yeah, I'll tell you what, when we come back to Toronto, because we were shooting out of town, we're actually shooting in my hometown. Uh, he said, I'll, I'll pick you up. We'll go to my church and you can check it out. And I said, yeah, definitely. And that was the first time I went to Kinesa Fellowship. That was the first time I went to an, a Seventh-day Adventist church. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it, instantly I was like, yes, this mm -hmm. is what I've been reading. Wow. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and even now when I look back, it's like, you know, it's funny how you see things differently, you know, over time and God continues to help you to see things. But I just remember like looking at the way people were carrying themselves, the way people, uh, the things that they talked about. Um, the way that the things operated, I was like, yeah, this, tr this matches what I've been reading. And so from then on, I was like, okay, I'm going to attend now, you know, I'll fast forward many years now and several years I'll say, and, uh, well, I'll stop, I'll do a pit stop. I go to Vancouver for a quick, uh, for a little bit. And, um, and I am at a, at a church there, uh, 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 Richmond Seventh-day Adventist Church with Elder Bill Wong, excellent church, excellent people, good people, good, good people. Mm -hmm. um, didn't know how good they were at the time, but they're good people. And a brother there named Israel, a Jewish guy who had been converted. Mm -hmm. <laughs> These names, right? Emmanuel, Israel, mm -hmm. like the people, mm -hmm. but um, he gave me some DVDs of Walter Veit. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And nice. this was, so this was like, man, I, it was a while back. And so he gives me the DVDs. I go home, I check them out. And I'm like, Whoa. what is this? Which, which series what was it? Was he it gave me Total the, Onslaught. Total Onslaught, yeah. So I watched a little bit of it, but I'm like, this is, at the time, I'm like, this is crazy talk. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is crazy talk. This is never going to happen. <laughs> so I go back, I'm like, thanks, bro. No, I'm good. That's you know? so funny. Because so, he, he's got some pretty solid evidence of what he's presenting. So, so there might be a lot of people that don't know who Walter Fight is that, that maybe watch our channel. God bless him. So he was an atheist um, professor from a college university mm -hmm. that taught evolution. In South Africa. In mm -hmm. South Africa. Mm -hmm. and, and he actually ended up studying the Bible to try to prove it was wrong wow, and proved yeah, himself right. into the faith and uh now he just he just has a really beautiful series um that goes over world events yeah. and shows kind of this connection to like where end time events meets the bible meets yes. like you know things that are going on in the world today yes and actually that guy is the one that woke me up yeah he woke my brother up wow so i know we share that in common yes and, yes and it's like yeah. you know i remember popping in that that whole total onslaught series and it's like the wool just went off my yes. eyes and yes. i just was like whoa i can see what have i been doing you yes know? Yeah. yes exactly well, and i think you know you grew up in a, in a seven day Adventist home mm -hmm. i didn't and i'd been going to the church but there's there's a lot of not not so much at richmond but at other at other churches there's 
as many people that'll tell you, you know, you have to really dig in and go deeper as there are people that'll say, don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. You know, you're, you're doing good, young man. In fact, we'll encourage you, yo, you're having success in this acting thing. Go, go, you know, mm -hmm. good on you. You're mm -hmm. a real Adventist. So mm -hmm. it's like you get these mixed messages. Yeah. And so although I wasn't getting that at, at, at Richmond, but at this point, I, you know, I was kind of cemented in my nominal Christianity. You know, I can live my own life outside of church, and then I go to church on Saturday. You and separate I read the two. my Bible and I and I pray and really separate them because in my mind, I never even saw the hypocrisy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I just wait. So you were never challenged on that in terms of like, was there a gig that conflicted with Sabbath and you had to like? Not at that point, I wasn't challenged okay. on it. Um, but I'll come to that in a minute. Okay. So now I'm in LA, and this is when I, you know, I booked the 100. And this is when I first had my experience of challenging with the Sabbath. So okay. I uh, I get on the show. It's a big show. Um, and I'm one of the main characters. And I try as I'm negotiating my contract, because how it works is you get tested. So you don't actually, you go up against three other guys. You negotiate your contract first. Then you get to audition for the final role. Hmm. So it's a very smart way for them to do it because they have a lot of leverage on your first contract. So, because you don't have it yet, you don't have it yeah, yet. So you're willing so you, to sign whatever. Exactly. You just wow. want to get the job. So I, um, I tried to say to my managers and my agents, I said, "Listen, um, you know, I'm a Seventh Day Adventist. At this time, Devon Franklin was like yes. blowing up everywhere." Because which can we just explain for the viewers who he is? Devon Franklin. Um, how would I explain him? He is someone that promoted keeping the Sabbath as a as an entertainment mogul. And also, um, you know, has worked in the heart of the entertainment world, uh, working for people like Will Smith, uh, working with Oprah Winfrey, Oprah. Mm -hmm. um, but also has maintained his Sabbath principles. What path or religion are you? I was raised Seventh Day Adventist. Okay, and what does um, that mean? Seventh Day Adventist is a Christian denomination, mm -hmm. and one of the things that we believe is observing the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. So Friday night sundown, Saturday night sundown, as mentioned in the Ten Commandments, remember the Seventh Day to keep it holy. Uh, and then also Jesus uh, observes Sabbath as well. Yeah. So it's one day where I don't check my emails. I don't respond to work calls. I don't read From Friday night. Friday night sundown. Sundown. To Saturday, Saturday night sundown. Yeah. No work. You don't check your emails. No. That's, that's, like, a, a function. that's, a, that's like against the commandment of Hollywood <laughs> that thou shalt carry thy but Blackberry at all times. But you know what? Here's a good yes. thing. When you set boundaries. Yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. Up front. Up front. Here's what my commitment is. So we all agree. I Before love this, Before we even Devon. take the job or go yeah. down the road. Yeah. Here's a commitment. Yeah. Are we all agreeing this is okay? Mm -hmm. So then all I have to do is just make sure I keep the commitment. Yeah. Because the moment I break it. Yes. Is the moment they realize, oh, well, he wasn't that serious. Mm hmm but for me, Sabbath is a time to recharge. It's a time to rest. It's a time to spend time with my family. Uh, it's a time to spiritually reconnect. Yeah. Um, it's incredible. If I embrace who I am, wow. it will open doors, not shut them. Also, if your faith won't fit in the door that opens, yeah. then I argue, do not walk through that door. The door that God Whoa, has opened boy, for you will fit your faith. He's a producer or director or producer. both. He producer. was an executive. First, yeah, for and Sony, then, right? For Sony, and then he also was a producer and an actor, um, and he also now does uh, public speaking. That's mm -hmm. what and he's, he's author for, and well. an author. Very yeah. popular book, the, "The Weight" with Megan Good, which was about you know uh, abstinence. And that's his wife. And that was his, his ex-wife. Ex -wife. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, and uh, you know, I met him, and we have a pretty. We know each other pretty well, and he's always been very, very kind to me. I, okay. you know, I only say good things about him. Um, Nevertheless, uh, so he was blowing up at this time. We didn't know each other, but his story was everywhere. Which helped your case. Which helped, which I used for my case, exactly. And I was showing them, you know, this guy on Oprah. I said, you know, I want to keep the Sabbath. And they came back and they said, well, what we'll do is we'll do best efforts. And I was like, well, what's best efforts? And they were like, well, it means, you know, if everything goes wrong, you might have to work a Friday, go over a little bit. But we're going to make sure, you know, really try to make sure that you don't have to work. Okay. And I was like, that sounds reasonable. I didn't know Hollywood. <laughs> and I didn't know how they operate. Get and, you to sign. Yeah, exactly. And so I said, yeah, signed. First week I'm there, Friday, Eli, uh, 
where are you going? You know, you have your shoot tonight. I'm like, no, no, it's a Sabbath. You best efforts. Mm. And they're like, uh, no, you're definitely booked. We're doing an all night shoot tonight. Mm. You have your big speech tonight. Mm. And it's this, you know, this all night thing. There's this rain, there's a fight scene. And I give this, you know, em em embellished spe is this speech. Um, and I was there till the next morning, Oof. literally on Friday night. And I was like, I was so tired. I couldn't even go to church. And it was crazy because we're shooting in back in Vancouver, so I'm like, I'm back where I could actually go to my my home, like my church that I'd gone to. And um, I want to just say this quickly. I don't say this often, but um, Elder Bill Wong, I really appreciate him. Before I left, he's the only person who said, "Eli, L.A. is Sodom and Gomorrah, and I don't think you should go." Mm. And I and I really wish I'd listened to him, mm. and I didn't. But I appreciate that he said it because no one else said it. Mm. Um, and you know, it takes courage to say that to someone who, you know, when, when you know that they're not going to take it well. Um, so I appreciate Elder Bill. Anyhow, um, so I'm there, I have to work all Sabbath. And from then, after we shot the pilot, I go back home and a bunch of things happened. I had actually booked another role on a film called Godzilla. And it was like a major role. It would have been a huge break. And I had booked, um, a lead role on a show called Divergent which was like gonna pay me like a, a lot of money, a bunch of money. And- You would have been one of the actors on that. I would have been one of the actors, I booked it. Mm. But um, they had what's, my, they had my um, my rights on the 100. Can't remember the term right now. First, first rights, I can't remember what it's called right now. But anyway, they had to approve me to be released to do these Ooh. other jobs. And they didn't. They right. said, no, no, we need them. We don't know, we don't want something to conflict. And as soon as they did that, those other jobs fired me. And then they fired me. They didn't pick up my option. They had my option. That's the word. They yeah. had my option. And so I was like, so they got me to work on the Sabbath. They cut out my other jobs that would have been life, financially life-changing. And then they didn't even pick up my option. And that was when I first got un the understanding of how Hollywood works. I was like, oh, they don't care about you at all. Hmm. It's to like they will totally disrespect you. And so the next time I, you know, I, you know, licked my wounds, got back to it and I got it. I tested again for another show. I think it was the, maybe a year later. Um, one thing that I learned about that business is things go in cycles and you might be down once, but if you're consistent, mm -hmm. things will come around if you, you know, because they, they, you know, they always need fresh, fresh faces, fresh people, fresh blood, uh, for lack of a better term. Um, anyhow, so. Uh, I got another opportunity. I tested for a show that LeBron James was producing, kind of semi-autobiographical, Survivor's Remorse. And it wasn't a very good show. I'm glad I didn't do it. But they, I was testing and the same thing happened. They were like, I was like, I keep the Sabbath. And they were like, oh, you know, we'll, we'll do best efforts. I said, no, no, sorry. <laughs> I was like, no, 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 none of that this time. I know what that, I know what that means. I'm not doing it unless you guys, you know, give me the Sabbath. And they said, well, Eli, you're going to lose this show. And I said, okay, well, then I'm going to lose the show. But I'm not, I'm not testing. I'm not doing it. Because I knew they wanted me. And I knew the casting director. And uh, I said, I'm not doing it unless, uh, unless you guys give me the Sabbath. And they said, well, then you're going you're gonna to lose it. And I gave it up. And that was the first time I kind of stood on my squares, took, you know, stood by my principles. I felt better about that than I had felt about what had happened before. And so, you know, time went on and my career started to, Game momentum. Um, I did a movie called Race, and I was always adamant from that moment forward, from the very beginning of the auditioning process. Sabbath. Guys, you, I keep the Sabbath, so don't let me get into a situation where this is a conversation, mm. you know. And I started getting a little bit more, you know, assertive because I was like, because it's 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 a hard wall. I'm not doing anything if I can't do the Sabbath. And they're like, we don't know if you're ever going to work. I said, well, then maybe I'll never work, but mm. I'm not breaking the Sabbath. And so, and again, I'm still not even living right. I'm not living right. But I'm at least knowing I want to keep that. That is my principle. That's my line in the sand. So, um, so then I got the I got race, and they they said, yeah, you can do it, and you you can keep the Sabbath. And I was like, oh, so they respect you more in this business if you set boundaries mm -hmm. than if you just let them walk all over you. They actually want you more. They act like it's going to be a problem, but it's the more problems you give. That's why you hear about these diva actors because the more boundaries you set the more they actually want, it's like this, like, we want what we can't have right. kind of thing. 
And so I did that movie and it was a great learning experience. They actually tried to get me to work. They sent a Jewish guy to my door one Friday night and was like, I'm Jewish. I understand. Oh, but brother, terrible. And I was like, brother, you're Jewish. You should know better. Don't come here. Mm. He was like a top producer or something. And, and then uh, and then he said, you're right. I'm sorry. And he left. <laughs> like, and Random. Was like, I, was like, I hope that brother got converted. But anyhow. Um, so, yeah. So, you know, things are still progressing. I start. I did Ballers and then I, you know, and then I got Riverdale. And then um, I, I I got uh, one night in Miami and, you know, things are really cooking. Like, I'm like, you know, I'm meeting with everybody. I'm meeting with mm. everybody, you know, uh, Steven Spielberg's companies and, and Tyler Perry. And, you know, I'm, I have these people on my phone and I'm like, this is kind of crazy. I'm actually mm. like, I'm about to be famous. Like, this is crazy. You know, my agents are like, I'm signed with like this company that I always wanted to sign with, which is William Morris Endeavor. They're the top agency. And. And, you know, my agent, I remember her telling me, like, I got nominated for a Screen Actors Guild Award. And she was like, Eli, I just want you to know, you'll never you'll never be without work again. She's like, that's what that means. From getting that award. From that, yeah. And I was mm. like, what, well, what do you mean? And she was like, I'll always, it does, I don't know what level of fame you're going to have or what success you're going to have, but you'll, oh, I can always get you work now. I can get you work on a TV movie. I can get you work on a, anything, mm. you know. So after that movie, after One Night in Miami, I was like. I was like, okay, like I, I finally felt like I could breathe and all the work and all the sacrifice and all the things that had gone on throughout that time were kind of paying off. And how many years were you in LA doing this uh, up until this point? I'll hold that. I'll hold that. Okay. <laughs> but, but a while, a while. It Quite takes 10 is what I remember them always saying. Like before you even really start to figure it out. It's a good 10 Boy, years. that's an investment. You want to get there I was early. there 10 and I took off. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I had heard different things. I'd heard between six and 10, mm -hmm. but yeah, it takes a while. And um, so, so yeah, so I'm there and things are taking off. And then COVID hits. Literally like a few weeks after. In fact, I think I got COVID when I was shooting one night in Miami mm -hmm. and didn't know it because the Mardi Gras was going on at the same time mm -hmm. and all these people were in the city. And then I found out later that they had a huge outbreak mm -hmm. on the news. So I was like, I think I had it because I got super sick like one of my last days of shooting, but mm. we didn't know what it was. And it's funny because my mother had been emailing the family saying, guys, something is coming. Mm. You guys got to get ready. And we were like, mom, she's <laughs> she's always on shout YouTube. Shout out to mom. Yeah, shout out <laughs> mom. <laughs> Listen to your serious. mom. <laughs> Man, she she was like anyhow, but um. So you're saying you got the award and then the world shut down. So I got nominated for a Screen Actors Guild Award and no, no, I got the job and I did the job and okay. it was everyone knew it was like a a blacklist script and it was Regina had just won the Oscar and she was did it like it everyone it was it was just the it was one of the movies of the year mm -hmm. and so I my career was now in a different place as a result of doing that and I was hanging out with different people and things were different things were happening and then COVID hit. And I'm still, we're doing the promo and we're doing all the nominations, we're doing the stuff, but COVID is happening. And I remember when I was sitting at home and I was watching the news because of the lockdowns and they showed Naomi Campbell at LAX in a hazmat suit. Hmm. And I said, what is going on? Hmm. And then almost, I, can't, I think it was the same night, I just looked out my window and I was, I was on Tahunga Avenue in Studio City and I just saw military truck, military truck, military truck, oh, wow. military truck. And it was like 12, 12 of them. And I was like, and something in my head clicked and said, that Walter Veith guy was right. Mm. I said, this is exactly what he said was going to happen. Mm -hmm. It's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I couldn't even remember his name, actually. I just knew that who he was mm -hmm. from the video. And I went searching for him. And I found his videos. I found Total Onslaught. And... I watched them all in like three days, all 30 mm. videos. I just- That is heavy. That's oh a lot. Yeah, I watched them all. I was just like, yeah, I need up, to up. know everything about what's going on. And and it was now, it was the experience that you had where it was like spiritual things are spiritually discerned. Yeah. The wool came up over my eyes and I was like- Yeah, you see it. Oh man, this is- And, and now also because- when I had first gotten those DVDs, I hadn't really been in LA. I was still mm -hmm. in Vancouver. Mm -hmm. But now I'd had a career in LA mm -hmm. and I had met with these people and I had been told, offered to join sun worshiping cults. Mm -hmm. I had been offered to join, I had seen people that were Freemasons and seen how their success was. I had seen, uh, been put in hotels that were voodoo hotels and uh, seen people make seances on set and mm -hmm. wear snake rings. And I knew that everything that he was saying 
I knew it was true because I knew the people, I saw them do it every day. That was my life, was operating in this environment and thinking, really not even thinking as much as rationalizing, oh, I can be a light in the darkness. Mm -hmm. But I'm not a light in the darkness because mm -hmm. I'm living mm -hmm. crazy. Yeah. It's, you know, it's their system. And I think, you know, the good nature of of you and you when you understand the truth is I'm going to go in there and I'll help share, shed mm -hmm. the light. But this is a whole system of darkness that yeah. is like not interested in spreading the light. Absolutely. You're and a they, little tiny pin drop in this huge machine. And they know mm -hmm. a lot of what we don't think they know. It's not it's not, you know, mm -hmm. ignorant uh, uh, behavior. They know it. Mm -hmm. You know, the same person who offered to bring me into the sun cult said, I told, he said, what do you believe? I said, oh, I'm a seven day Adventist. Mm. He said, <laughs> I used to be a seven day Adventist. Mm. And I was like, oh, well, what do you believe? He's like, well, uh, in all my studies, I've determined that the only thing you can truly worship is the sun. Mm. Mm. And I was like, mm. uh, well, yeah, no. I was in his trailer and I was like, okay, well, it's good yeah. talk. You know, he was a big actor and, you know, I wanted to be, you know, he said he wanted to take me under his wing. He said Denzel had brought Nate Parker under his wing. He wanted to be, bring me under his wing. And I wanted that, but I wasn't, you know, I wasn't going to be in a sun worshiping call. Right. God had, I guess, just given me certain boundaries. And by his protection, as you said earlier, he just kept me from crossing them. Mm. And, um, but as I was learning more, I felt like God's ex expectations were getting more and more. And I started to see more and more things yes. as a problem that weren't a problem before for me, you know, and my personal life was still not in alignment. My personal life was still out of it. Even though I was trying, when you have strongholds in your life and when you're compromising constantly, it's really hard to walk a straight life when you're when you have a, a whole side of your life that is not straight. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, you can't walk on two sides of the street at the same time. And so um, so, but yeah, I watched Walter Veith. I'm, I see it all now at the exact same time that I'm finally in my career where I've always wanted to be. And so in that moment, I'm like, okay, I'm faced with a choice. And so I ended up getting another one more job and I kind of made that deal with God. I was like, okay, God, I need to just let me get this one job. Let me do one more job, get some money. And at this yes. point, I'm now watching Dr. O on, on YouTube and the State Line Seven of Church, the Sunday Law Update and learning about, you know, the Sunday Law is coming and we should get country land. In, and, in California, you're watching I mean, this. watching this from California. Okay. And so, you know, I'm like, God, I need country land. I need money for country land. Let me do one more job. <laughs> Interesting justification. Yeah. <laughs> and I'll get country land. And so, Which never works out because all of that is relying on your own strength. Exactly, and God yes. is like, I don't work that way. Exactly. And so yeah. I did this job. I ended up, you know, doing one more job and it didn't, the real payout was second season. The, I got a good chunk of money the first season, but the second season was where I was going to have like, you know, some big money. And I had a, a movie deal that was coming out and I had a podcast and a bunch of things were kind of lined up for one more year. And so then the conversation became, okay, I got a mortgage, but I was like, one more season and <laughs> mm. god was really speaking to my heart like no no wow. no mm. and um i i talked to my mom and i said mom listen like i'm one year away from like making enough money like you don't have to work again you know and and uh i can you know do a lot of different things and um but i need to do you know i need to finish a couple jobs but i told her you know i was on this show and it was a very uh satanic show it was produced by jesuits and, uh, mm. you know, there was a lot of scenes in there where even one scene, I'll give an, uh, one quick story is um, they were shooting a scene where they're creating my body on it on a it's basically they make it's a show about you travel to the future and they give you avatar bodies. Okay. And so they're, they're making my body on this slab and they have all this semi biblical language that they're using as they're making it. And, you know, he formed him out of the dust and all this weird stuff in the script. And there's all kinds of like they're showing left eyes all over the place. It's like super, you know, crazy stuff. And you you know all this. You're aware of all this. It's not just in post. Like no, I'm a, I see it in the up. script, and I'm actually oh, I even okay. see this is the thing, right? Like when you want to be ignorant, you'll be ignorant because I even messaged Walter Veith, and I was like, "You see, I got this script. I sent him screenshots of the script. I said, you know, should I do this?" And he didn't get back to me, and I was like, "Well, guess I should do it." <laughs> you know, as opposed to like the Bible clearly says you already know. So why would he? You need to tell Walter Veith if you know it. It's like Balaam, you know. Exactly you know, like Balaam. Yeah. You know, exactly but like you're, you're going to try to find, okay, God, maybe, maybe there's a, a good outcome. That exactly. Come out Ex and, you know, looking for the donkey to tell you, you know. And so, um, so anyway, I'm on this slab and they're shooting and they got the camera over me. And 
as they're doing it, they're, they're saying like my face is going to be created from this side to this side. And I already know they're going to cut off half my face so that just one of my eyes is showing. Mm, and, so, and I'm like, I don't want that. I don't want to be on camera like that, you know? And so, especially I've watched Walter Vyth. I know these guys are Jesuits. Mm. They told me they're Jesuits. They sat down with me and they said, we're Jesuits. And I was like, this is crazy. <laughs> and so, um, and so I'm like, I don't want that. So I close my eyes. I'm like, if I close my eyes, then they can't get one eye open, right? Mm. And they said, the director's in the back. He's like, open your eyes. And I'm like, no. <laughs> and then he's like, he's like, we need to get the shot. And I'm like, no, because, you know, in, in the last shot, my eyes were closed. Plus, if you're making my eyes, you got to make my eyelids so my eyes would be closed. And he's like, yeah, I guess that's true. And then they go back. Mm. Mm. But we still want to get it just in case. <laughs> right. I'm like, oh, yeah. no. And then so I open my eyes. And then the next day, they bring us in to see a reel of the cuts that they made so far. The very last shot is them making half my face with my one eye. Mm -hmm. And I said, I can never get that back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can never get that back. Mm -hmm. People are always going to, you know what I mean? See, the it's, it's alarming when you when you actually look up on the internet, how many celebrities have been photographed with only one eye yeah. or covering mm -hmm. one eye. I mean, it's everybody. Yeah. And it's like, they can't just be doing that just because. I mean, that's just so random. How well, many pictures have you taken like that? You know, it's but, like, they, right. but there are, there are people that will... I was in a photo shoot where someone gave me an apple. Mm. Said, yeah, we just want you to eat the apple. And I was going to do it. I was like, oh, yeah, cool. An apple. And I was like, whoa, mm -hmm. whoa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I see what you guys like are doing. Mm -hmm. yeah, you know? But it's your image out there, not theirs. Exactly. And also, I only stopped because I know. But if I didn't know, mm -hmm. if I was just a young actor mm -hmm. doing a photo shoot, you're doing a magazine, you're excited, they give you an apple. Yeah, I'll eat the apple, eat orange, whatever, you know? Yeah. So I did that and I know what's up. And so I go to them and I'm like, listen, I don't ever want that to come out. You know, I give a whole bunch of other reasons. I didn't just say, hey, you guys are a bunch of Jesuit and Masons and I don't want, you know, your agenda. Yeah. But I gave a bunch of, you know, other reasons. I said, you know, it's not continuity for the other stuff and blah, 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 my artistic integrity. And they agreed and they sent me an email and da, 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 da. And it didn't come out, I don't think, on the show. But I know they have it. And it bothered me. And so I told my mom that. And I, and I said, you know, but I got, I'm trying to decide if I should do season two. And, you know, I, I said, it's big money. And she said, Eli, you already know. And it's funny because I know, you know, it, the money would have really helped. And I was expecting her to say, yeah, just do one more season and then, you know, you'll be good. And that's like moms, man. There's, you know, um, she was like, Eli, it sounds to me like you already know what you're going to get. And if you do that, you know that there's going to be a cost. Yep. Mm. And mm. so I don't see how you could do it. And she said, if you do it, you're going to be a hypocrite because you're going to tell all these other young people, Not to don't do, do this after you've gotten all that money. And that's why you left. Mm. Wow. And it bothered me that she said that. I was like, hypocrite. I didn't like that. You know what I mean? I didn't like that she said that. It bothered me. Strong word. Yeah, it was a strong mm. word. But it was like, but I thought about it and I was like, okay. And then I was like, oh, still, I was praying. And I went to church the next day and I was in the parking lot. And I said, God, okay. I'm going to do this, but you need to you need to make it crystal clear that this is what I should do. And I literally walked in and Dr. O was preaching and he he's standing there and he goes, something, I don't know what's making me say this, no way. but somebody in here needs to know they need to come out of Babylon. And he goes on a full sermon wow. on Hollywood. He starts wow. talking about- So Dr. O is in Devon. Alabama. You, Dr. O is in Alabama. Yeah. So at this Alabama? point I moved, I bought my country oh, house, okay, okay. but I was on a mortgage, but I got, you know, some land. Um, but he did a full sermon on it about coming out of Hollywood and he didn't, it wasn't like he saw, like he was doing it for me. He just said something came over me and he's like that. If you guys had yeah. ever, he's like that. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I was like, all right. So that day on the Sabbath, I, I wrote an email and I just messaged my whole team. I said, listen guys, uh, you know, I'm, I'm retiring. Mm. And they were like, they were surprised because it's just a surprising thing, but they said it made sense with who they knew me to be and that they could see there was always a struggle since the Sabbath stuff. So an email was enough? How hard was it to get out of that? Uh, it was enough. It was enough, I think, because people knew me. But I think that the... No, I'm talking contract. Oh, con well, that was the other thing, right? So I was under contract for that show, which is why, like I had a whole, like I said, I had a movie deal and a bunch of other things, but I had to do the show because, again, they had my option. Mm. So they were going to let me do all that other stuff this time, but I had to do the show. And... I was like, the only way out, the only way I can I can move forward to is to retire. Oh wow! Wait, so you can retire and then you avoid problems with the contract? Yeah, you can always retire. What? Anyone can retire, right? Like That's if I'm a boxer and yeah, I have a boxing lose contract, all your jobs. Like, you lose everything, everything and you lose like, the trust of the industry, right? Because yeah. right. you, you know, M Michael Jordan can retire 
and come back, well, yeah, you're going to take them back. But, yeah. you know, if someone else on that team, other than not named Michael Jordan, had done what he did, they would be like, no, buddy. Yeah, so if like Brad mm -hmm. Pitt retired you. and came back, yeah, sure. Yeah, exactly. You know. We'll take Brad Pitt. He can retire yeah. 10 times. Yeah. But, you know. Which is what what's the football player did. Uh, Ricky Williams? No, no, no. The one uh, who was married to a witch. The, the goat. Oh, He's yeah. Not, he was married uh, like three Tom. times. Tom Brady. Oh, yeah. Tom Brady. Brady. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They'll always take Tom back, right? But there's other a lot of other football players who will retire for mm -hmm. good reasons, and they won't take him back, even wow. though they can... Colin Kaepernick, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. They'll never let Colin play. Colin's a great mm -hmm. player, mm -hmm. and I'm not a promoter of sports, but he's very talented, um, but they'll never let him play yeah. because it's, it sets a precedent. No, you can't just come and go, mm -hmm. you know, but certain people, they can and certain can't. But anyhow, um, you know, they offer me, even till recently, they offer me a lot of roles. And Eli, are you sure? Are you sure? Mm -hmm. But, you know, I'm sure. So well, um, you retired when? So I retired just over a year ago. Okay. And, you know, I would say... Right around COVID is when I really, I started to kind of face those demons of living. Once I started to read Adventist Home mm -hmm. and it showed me what, you know, what real manhood was about. And I started to really kind of look at where my life was at and the kind of things that I was compromising on and um, some other things went on. And I was just like, you know what, it's time to make some changes. And, and I did some serious prayers with some people that I felt certain things break off. Mm -hmm. and that I had been struggling with. And um, and from then, you know, I felt that was another reason why I was ready to walk away because I felt like I really had a lot of power from the Holy Spirit and victory in, in my life to really like live right. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to be playing with that. Mm -hmm. right. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. okay. And so, so yeah, so I, I messaged them and then, uh, and then I retired, yeah. Mm -hmm. But I mean, that, that, that's got to, that's got to really also be, you know, where your head space is at with like, you know, the truth, there's yeah. a good reason. So your mind isn't going to constantly be playing games exactly. with you. Like, well, what, what, what my life would have exactly. been like if I would have done this or that. It's like, no, we're at the end of this war <laughs> exactly. and you can see it in front of you. Exactly. And I, yeah, I think compromise seems to be the key. You see a lot of actors, I mean, their lives generally, um, there's probably ones that can steer clear of like the real messy lives, but mo most of the real successful people, if you could dive into their personal life, there's a lot of compromise that happens and they get themselves in a lot of trouble. And so it, I, I kind of felt like that way too. When you read the Bible, you really understand the principles that are there it's really hard to rectify those two worlds together. They it's just impossible. don't seem like they line up at all. Yeah, it's impossible. You, you know, you'd have to be, you can only do it when you're in ignorance mm -hmm. because the Bible says, you know, come out of her, my people. And mm -hmm. so there's, once you understand that this is Babylon and this is like the, mm -hmm. the, the mouthpiece of Babylon, mm -hmm. this is the agenda speaking, message creating mm -hmm. entity of Babylon. Mm -hmm. And you are representing Christ, who has the exact opposite message, but you're allowing them to use you as their tool to promote their message. Mm -hmm. So it's they're, they're totally incongruent. Mm -hmm. Someone, you know, I don't even think like, you know, something like this, where you're doing an independent ministry or where you're doing a, a documentary or something in that form, I think you can serve the Lord with media. Mm -hmm. But as far as doing scripted, dramatic, um, the, the types of entities that Hollywood has created as the forms of how you deliver content, those things are, I mean, even when you look at the the, um, the networks and the distributors mm. and the people that have to filter your stuff to get it out to mass medias, ma mass audiences, it's totally controlled by a uh, an agenda that is going to try to cause you to have at least have compromise, mm -hmm. and right. then right. even more so try to promote a, a ungodly agenda. Yeah, what, wasn't it? Um, Sound of Freedom was bought originally purchased with from Disney, and they shelved it for like seven years. And you would really, think, yeah, you would think like Disney has always sold themselves as the family friendly company, right? Yeah. That's their kind of like they tried to have the squeaky clean look, and it's like wouldn't that company be interested in protecting children? Mm. I mean... It's the opposite. <laughs> yeah, it's very interesting to me that they became the, um, I think, stopping point for a while. I think there was a big court battle to like wrestle that back to where they could actually release it. And, and you know, I'll be honest with you, even like, I think everyone's at different levels, but even a movie like that, you know, mm -hmm. I would look deeper into it. And mm -hmm. I know you guys have done studies on mm -hmm. Passions of the Christ mm -hmm. and, you know, movies that for instance, I'll just give examples. Like there's a lot of people that talk about like, why couldn't you just be a Christian actor, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of people ask me that. Mm -hmm. But 
ninety percent of those Christian movies deal with spiritualism. That's right. You know, someone's coming down from heaven. Yeah. They're talking to their, yeah. you know, this angel that was a dead person and is now an angel and is helping them through problems or, mm. you know, uh, near death experiences where they saw God and you know miracles do happen and all this kind of stuff, which is totally unbiblical. Right. Right. And right. so the idea, like, I have some really close friends that are huge producers in the Christian Christian space. Um, but you know, I can't work with them mm -hmm. because we have different, I, I have a message that is the truth for this time from, mm -hmm. from the book of revelation 14, mm -hmm. uh, six and seven. Mm -hmm. And they have a message that is kind different. of a, a, a different message. That's a totally mm -hmm. non, you know, it's, it's truth mixed in error. It's, mm -hmm. it's Bible mixed with tradition. And, you know, so those two things, um, you know, I have to stand on my spot and say right. what I know is right. Absolutely. I think you made the right choice. I really do. Um, every time I've been kind of near LA and gone back there, there, there is just like an, uh, that, like you can feel there's something different about that location. Absolutely. And, um, I, you know, people kind of say, well, what is it like electricity or they'll say like it's a energy or whatever like that. Yeah. I, I think there's a lot of demonic activity. Why wouldn't there be? I mean, if this is a if this is a mouthpiece of information, mm. I mean, you think about it, people aren't just walking into a satanic church, right? But they'll click on the TV. But you're clicking on the TV, so the devil has to get his information to the people somehow, and it's like these are his churches, these are his pastors, these are his ways of sharing that information with the world. No, not everybody recognizes that, but I do think that the majority of it is not upholding righteousness, holiness, godly attributes that we know the Bible is trying to teach Absolutely. and promote. I mean, even on things like a like a nature show, you know, when you watch when you turn on Netflix and you're like, "Oh, I know, I'll just watch something totally non-harmless. -har Let's watch, you know, Lions of the Savannah." The first thing you'll hear when you turn it on, million, 6 million, million years, years yeah. ago, the lions roam. And it's like, no, that's not mm -hmm. true. The Bible mm -hmm. says that the world is, you know, not uh, just over 6,000 years old and, mm -hmm. or just around 6,000 years old. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, you know, but so that's, you, that stuff yes. affects people, right? Yeah. They, they, as you're, you're a kid and you watch that, you just assume that that's true. It's mm -hmm. a sermon. And, you know, like Planet Earth, one of the most amazing cinematic pieces that highlights this just awesome planet that god made no credit to him whatsoever mm -hmm. there you go and that's just the sad reality of it and it's like you know i i just don't believe that it is as easily you know able to promote a really wholesome righteous you know god fearing lifestyle uh i i think even in the christian space there's a lot of mixture in those. Yeah, absolutely. A lot. Yeah. Okay, so you sent that email saying that you're retired. That was yeah. about a year, a year and a half ago. Yeah. Where are you today? I've been spending a lot of time, obviously, studying my Bible, you know, reading Spirit of Prophecy. Uh, Can we just explain for the viewers what Spirit of Prophecy, what do we mean by that? Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. So Alan White, who um, was one of the founders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church and is a uh, a prophet, I believe, based on what I've read and how that lines up with the Bible and not because of anything she said. That's nothing that she said is different than what the Bible says, but it just allows you to have a, a commentary and an understanding on a deeper level. Um, and so I've appreciated those writings because they've helped me in my Bible study, um, which is always first and foremost. Mm -hmm. um, but as I've studied those things, it teaches about proper diet, for instance, uh, teaches about um, how to be a better son, how to be a better man, how to be a better member of your church, a uh, better member of your community, um, the types of uh, work that you might want to learn and skills that you want to have. Like she talks a lot about uh, learning a trade. And so mm -hmm. one of the things that I started to do, I went back to school and I started to learn carpentry. And, cool. Uh, cool. Yeah. And I, I got a job working at a place that builds cabinets and started you know practicing my skills with that just so I can have an actual practical skill. Because Revelation 13 says that there's going to come a time when no man shall be able to buy or sell, save he that had the mark of the beast or the number of his name. And so I want to be able to um, have skills that are pliable in mm -hmm. that time that allow me to help take care of my family, help take care of my needs. Mm -hmm. Because I believe that time is in the next few short years, however many years that are, I don't think it's far away at all. Um, and I'll just say the other thing I've been doing is um, doing a lot more outreach and ministry. And so you know, giving my testimony, places like this, traveling to churches. Uh, and I started, you know, I had an Instagram following at, when I 
finished acting. It was, you know, 130,000 or something like that. And I was just going to shut it down. I had never actually run it. I had gotten my sister to run it because I didn't want to be too close to right, that people uh, that I didn't know and have, you know, issues. But um, but when I retired, um, I was like, okay, should I just cancel it? And I was praying about it. We had an all night prayer at my church, and I got I got home, and I, the quarterly, uh, which is a Bible study, um, was on my table. And God just put it on my heart, you know, start reading the quarterly on your on the live on Instagram. Mm-hmm. And so that's how I started. I named uh, the the lives. I called them the Last Generation Live, and uh, so we started doing quarterly studies and um, current events. Um, because there was things in Matthew 24 and in Revelation that were that God had put on my heart that were either going to happen quickly or had had been happening. And mm. so when we saw the things like the earthquake in Turkey, and I was like, you know what? I should talk to people about these things because it mm. says that there's going to be earthquakes in diverse places. Right. It says that there's going to be pestilence. It's like which we saw in COVID. It says that there's going to be um, wars and rumors of wars and, and civil wars and all these things, yep. which we're seeing. And so I started talking about those current events on the live and then doing studies and and um, and so it, and then we started having certain guests and things like that. So at some point I might you know pull one of you guys and hopefully you'd sure. be willing. But <laughs> yeah. Um, but yes, yeah, sure. it's it's it's, uh, it's on my Instagram um, uh, at the real Eli Gore, uh, and um, yeah, it's just that's what I've been doing as far wow. as that, just traveling and trying to get the message out there. Okay, so as we wrap up here, I'll pose the question this way: You're an actor turned carpenter. <laughs> Are you just as fulfilled in this life as you were in the past? I would say it's so amazing that you asked that because I wondered that. You know, I. I was never, the money thing was more because I knew I could take care of my family. The fame thing was not that important to me. Mm. And people that would often ask me, even when I was an actor, like, do you think you're, you know, my buddy who had a term, a lifer, meaning like you're going to be an actor for the rest of your life. Mm. And I was always like, no, I'm not a lifer. I'm going to do something else for sure. But I just didn't know what. But it, it fulfilled me because of what I learned when I worked with Ryan, the craft, the the be, ability to see a process and to bring something to fruition was it's a powerful feeling Mm. and when you start to get good at it it's a very powerful feeling and i remember there's a story in the bible of that uh i think it was a a woman no it was a man who who people came to him and he did miracles he did false miracles under under Mm. uh by satan's power simon and then, and then he saw that they were able to do miracles under Jesus' power. He said, I'll pay you for that. And, you know, right. and they said, yeah. no, 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 you can't pay us for that. And then he followed them, right? And so I think I had learned a craft that had power. It had power. I saw it. I saw how the impact it had on people, on fans, on people that would see it, people I went to high school with, and, you know, just everybody. You know what I mean? But then when I learned this truth and I learned this beautiful message and I saw all the connections of like, wow, this really is a great controversy. Mm. We really are in the last days and Jesus really is coming soon. It, it gave me a different fulfillment that was even greater that I never could have imagined. And doing ministry um, has, it, I, I'm, I'm surprised, but it really is fulfilling and more so than the other thing. Um but I, but only thing I will say is that I still do get um, inklings, not to go back to the industry, but creative ideas. Sure. Things will come to me and I'll say, oh, man, I know. Like just the other day, I was like, man, that's a great concept for a show. I already know who would produce it. I know who would shoot it. I already know that I could get this person to sell it. And I'm like, no, no, that's that's the past. Okay. You totally know, yeah, separate. I'm like, that's okay. that doesn't, you know, and it's not anything even like immoral stuff, but it's like that is their system. Mm-hmm. And it's a lie. And I'm not going to be in that system, you know. And I'm grateful because God will give me other inspirations. You know, he'll give me a sermon or he'll give me, I'll be walking and I'll see something happen in the news and I'll say, oh, that's a, that's in spirit of prophecy. I can talk about that tonight and show the people the connection of, wow. you know, this and this. So God, you can, you know, there's two sources of inspiration as human beings. There's Satan can inspire people. He gives people all kinds of abilities and, and influence and money and all kinds of different things, right? You look at any major musical artist out there, they're, those are not, they're very creative, but that's not coming from God, right? And God can inspire you. Absolutely. I and mean, he gave the talent, didn't he? He gives you the talent and he and he can make the most of it for the, for the, 
I think the thing that's the most valuable to me now is just seeing souls saved. Amen. Just Amen. seeing souls won, seeing people get that message. The same, you know, the same thing that all of us have had that moment where we realize, oh man, this is real and there's a real heaven, there's a real hell, and I want to be with Jesus, you know? Amen. And when you see other people when it when the when it drops and they see it and they know it's true, and then they start going with it. Th th there's nothing like that. There's nothing like that. I, I think it's just really neat and powerful that, you know, Jesus was able to pull you out of something before you got in a little bit too far, yeah. you know, because you were pretty far already mm -hmm. yeah, making right. the big bucks and all that kind of stuff. But man, that is powerful. And I, I just really hope that people who hear this message will take away that Jesus is coming very soon. Mm -hmm. We see it all around us, just the signs of the times. What is it? Matthew 24, I mm -hmm. believe. Mm -hmm. um, he's coming. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, like I've been coming to this conviction for myself, mm -hmm. having in a church, been in church this long, having been a Christian this long. I, I need to change. Mm -hmm. You know, I need to get my act together. I need to spend mm -hmm. more time with the Lord not making it righteous by by my own acts, salvation through my own acts and works, but through Jesus, but still to be like, Lord, I, I need you, you mm -hmm. know, and I want to have more of you because, um, because you're coming soon. And I really hope that when people hear your story, that they're going to want the same thing because, you know, Satan offered the whole world to Jesus yeah. <laughs> and he didn't take it. Mm -hmm. And I can see that a lot of celebrities have taken it and praise the Lord that you decided to follow Jesus and say no. And I'd rather surrender all of that and follow Jesus. It's almost like the devil's offering the exact opposite of what Jesus offered. He says, look, if you leave houses, lands, mother, father, he says, I will repay you how much? A hundredfold. A hundredfold. Yeah. Do you know how much that is? Like we can't a even lot. fathom that, right? <laughs> yeah. And and he's just like, look, God is a very fair God. He knows like you have these passions and you have these these gifts, but it's so easy. The devil says, no, I'll bend it for you and you'll get the glory. And it's like, if you just learn how to take what God has given you and point the glory to him, I mean, you will be satisfied when you get to heaven and people yeah. come up to you and say, I'm only here in heaven because, because of something of you. that you or you or you did. That is something I don't think money can buy. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Eli, for being here with us. Thank you. For sharing your story. This was an amazing conversation and we hope you were blessed as well. If you'd like to get in contact with Eli, or maybe you watch any of the videos that he's posting, those details will be in the description of this video. If you'd like to learn more about Little Light Studios, watch some of the documentaries that we have produced. You can go to littlelightstudios.tv. All the information is on that site. Thank you so much for watching. We pray that you have a blessed weekend. We're here on YouTube, LED Live, every Friday at noon. So please subscribe so you don't miss an episode. Bye-bye. Every day is an opportunity to show kindness to the world. Every day is an opportunity to do something that lets someone know you're thinking of them. Every day is an opportunity to give without expecting anything in return. Every day is an opportunity to notice someone in need and to go out of your way to help them. Every day is an opportunity to do one small thing, to show someone you care, to make the world a better place. If you're looking for good, wholesome, educational content for your children, subscribe to our new channel, Little Light Kids.